Our text today is the 15th, 16th chapters of the book of Kings. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. <clears throat> the worst war that America ever fought the bloodiest and by far the costliest was the Civil War. The Union against the Confederacy, the North against the South. Perhaps it is because the bitterest feud is always a blood feud where brother is ranged against brother. And that is the story of the Book of Kings from this point forward to the end of the era. The people of Israel were a united nation for a relatively short period of time. It was the warrior King David who got it all together for them for the first time and expanded their borders to the full extent of God's promise to them. Then King Solomon came along and embroidered a 40-year period of peace and prosperity fondly remembered as the golden age of Israel. But at the death of Solomon, everything came unraveled. Many factors played a part, not the least of which was the arrogance and stupidity of Solomon's son and successor on the throne. But the prophets of God took this viewpoint of it. You don't want a nation under God and with God? Well, then see how you like a country apart from God and without God. The ten northern tribes of Israel seceded from the Union and formed an independent country with a king of their own choosing. They were called the Kingdom of Israel. The two remaining tribes in the south, with Jerusalem as the capital, became known as the kingdom of Judah. And the breach between the north and the south was never healed. The break was followed by centuries of civil war. The general direction of both kingdoms was downhill, uh, drifting farther and farther away from the Lord. And the downhill decline in the north was much steeper and faster than in the south. Twenty kings came to the throne of northern Israel. All of them walked in the sins of Jeroboam. None of them walked in the ways of the Lord. Whereas in the south, now and then a good king did come along who tried a reformation who attempted to bring his people back to God again. And that's why the kingdom in the south lasted 123 years longer before the end came. Now, neither king of the first dynasties, Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south, could have believed where the wrong direction would have led. The ruin which their first steps were to bring upon their people. Sin is easy to start, but sin never stops when you think it's gonna or when you expect it to. Like raindrops, individual sins don't look like much, but you put a lot of them together and you've got a storm turning streams into rivers and rivers into swollen floodwaters, catching people unprepared, off guard, and sweeping them away. Now, this section of Scripture poses a problem for every Bible reader, not only because these ancient kings are so distant, but the history itself is so difficult, for it keeps changing scenes here in the text. While this was going on in the north, this is what was happening in the south. 
King Jeroboam in the north saw three kings come and go on the throne of Jerusalem. And then Asa, king in Jerusalem, seized the scepter change hand seven times in the northern capital of Tirzah. And it's hard to keep track of both streams of action at the same time. And then the names of these kings are strange sounding to our ears. Some of them are similar. Some of them are even the same. And so, the two chapters before us today set the stage for the greatest confrontation in the Old Testament. When King Ahab takes the throne and the infamous woman Jezebel beside him and out of the wilderness comes the great prophet Elijah, the best against the worst. You do get the impression from these chapters that the times were stormy indeed with wars and rumors of wars tensions and conflict between the conservatives and the liberal element, the law and order guys against the terrorists and the anarchists. And the scene changes so quickly, much as it does in our world of today. In the last world war, Japan was our mortal enemy. Then became our ally against the communist nations and now is considered a dangerous competitor and threat to America once more. In exactly the same span of time covered by these two chapters. But as your finger goes down the page, you get the notion that it was the same kind of world a world in which the Richard Nixons and the Ollie Norths, the Margaret Thatchers and the Donald Trumps would feel right at home. And the CIA operatives and the IRS agents and the savings and loan bankers and the Wall Street manipulators, yeah, and throw in the TV evangelists as well. The bad guys weren't all bad in a criminal sense of the word, however. Some of them are likable characters, even for the wrong that they did. And other, others of them were very capable and qualified individuals, outstanding patriots who tried their best to help their people. What's not clear to us is how the Bible appraises each one. The man David is the standard by which all of the others are mentioned, are measured. This line occurs repeatedly. So-and-so walked, did not do that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and he did not seek the Lord with the whole heart as his father David did. David, that strikes us as strange that he should be the standard, for David was no angel. David was certainly no lily-white model of perfection. In fact, David's vices stand out in our memory almost as well as his virtues. The shameful part he played in the ruin of a man's marriage and his life is almost as shocking as the heroic role he played against the giant Goliath. But friends, there's a good reason for this. David had a different and a deeper understanding of sin and grace than many of his day or our day. David did not look upon his misdeeds as isolated sins of greater degree or lesser degree. If you were to read the Psalms, and David wrote half of them, the penitential Psalms, you would notice that David does not classify his sins at all as grade A type sin, grade B. He doesn't even single any out for mention. David says things like this. 
Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David saw that his entire nature was sinful and carnal and unspiritual. David knew that he needed more than to get control of his anger and his sexual drive. David believed he had to become a different person. And that's what he prayed in the prayer that you know. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. No, make me different. Do you see how that applies to our lives today? At the end of a long day, you and I may confess our sins to God. How we swore at the boss behind his back. Or lost our temper with a co-worker. Or how he came home and started yelling at the kids and even kicked the dog. Now, it's right that we confess those misdeeds and sins because that's what they are. Oh, but people were treating the symptom. The disease is much deeper than that. It infects our human nature, which itself is sinful. Most people will tell you to treat the symptom. That if you're hot-tempered, well, you should take a course on anger management. And if you're going to keep kicking the dog, you should go over to the Humane Society and learn proper behavior toward dumb animals. No, no. That's treating symptoms. Like taking an aspirin when you've got a bad headache. The aspirin will help the headache, but... It doesn't touch the thing that's causing the headache. That's what makes the exchange between Nicodemus and Christ so amazing. Jesus says to the old scholar, you got to be born again. No, it ain't what you have or what you do. It's who you are. Self-discipline. Self-improvement, self-development are still dealing with the same old self. And you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. What is required, Nicodemus, is a new person, a new creation, lifted up an entirely different new kind of life. And what does old Nicodemus say? He answers beautifully. You're right, Jesus. I agree with you. When I was young like you, I thought that all things were possible. The future, bright and promising. No mountain too high to climb. No lofty ideal unattainable. But... I'm not a boy anymore. And how can I go back and start my life over from the day of my birth? I cannot undo what I have done. I don't get a second chance at the mistakes that I have made and the defeats that I have suffered. I believe you're right, Jesus. You've got to become a new kind of person. But how? How is that possible when my life is what it is and I can't go back and start over again? And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you can, you must be born again. Of course you can't give birth to yourself any more than you gave birth to yourself the first time. But God can, and God does, and the Holy Spirit can give you a new life, make of you a wonderfully new creature inside and out with an entirely different and better personality. 
Are you and I forgetting this? Have we heard this story so many times that we're tired of hearing it and don't pay any attention at all anymore? Most of us have known from little on that Jesus came in the world to die on the cross, to take away our sins, to substitute himself for our death. That's okay, because that's what the Bible teaches. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Not imputing means God doesn't write it down under your name. He doesn't charge your sins to your account. But it's more than that. It's better and greater than that. The Bible says in the same place, God made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Get this. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Did you get that? Not only does God cross off all the garbage in my life, all the dirty, rotten things I've done, he also imputes to me the good stuff that Jesus did. No, he writes that in under my name in the book of life. The beautiful things, the wonderful, the compassionate, the kindly, the merciful things that Jesus did. Now you try to imagine that glorious scene when the hour comes and it's my turn to stand before my maker and he says, get the book on parcher. And as he opens it up and his eye runs down the page, he looks up with amazement and says to me, parcher. You did all this stuff. Hey, Lord, it's your book. And it's the life that you gave me in Christ. Now, you think on that for a minute. Bask in it and appreciate that. A comforting sense of helplessness steals over us. That nothing can disturb the relationship. The life that you have with Christ. Have you ever noticed at wedding anniversaries where a couple of people have weathered the storms and the stress of 50, 60 years of life together? They want no recognition or reward. That ain't the reason they did it in the first place. And they know that they have hurt and disappointed each other many times over the years. But it isn't what they've done or not done. Get it? The miracle is the relationship. It's the life together that nothing good or bad could disturb. And so it is with Christ. Circumstances may vary in his company from childhood to old age. And the scene may change from this world to the next world. But the main thing, the relationship, the life you have together with him can never change. Friend, Savior, Lord, forever. Amen. peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.